Well, it's very lovely. Good to see you this evening. We are looking and diagnosing both our church, comparing it with Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. You don't have to turn there tonight. Uh, you've read it several times. You know it very, very well. I'm going to remind you of a verse of scripture tonight uh, that accompanies what we're going to say. You know this verse very well is also, it is um, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 when the Lord says to those who were listening to him and to us by way of the written word, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me tie that with the Great Commission to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything, whatever it is, teaching them to obey it, those things that I've commanded you. And that's God's word to us and that's, that's what he says and that's what the church is all about. Yes, we are, we are here to worship and glorify God. Absolutely. That's one reason we're here. That's why we gather to lift our voice to God. But then once we go out, we have a sign right over here. It says, you are now entering the mission field. How old is that sign? Reckon how old it's been there. Y'all know? More than 10 years. 20 years. 25. 30. Do I hear 40? I'm asking because what happens is after you see something so many times you don't see it anymore. You just don't see it. And then somebody else comes along and they say, wow, check that out. I don't know, uh, Teresa, if this happened to you, um, Cyrus, if it happened to y'all, I'd have volunteers come in you know, to where I was on the mission field, and I'd be uh, trucking along in my truck and taking them places, and they'd say, check that out over there. And, and I'd look and say, oh, yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? But I'd seen it so many times, it lost its uh, impact on me. Uh, about the only thing that never lost its impact was our Walmart. And it was this wall covered with whatever you wanted, you know, and that was Walmart for us. You want to go to Walmart, you went there, and that's where you bought your stuff, standing up against the wall. So, folks, we, I'm telling you that because we become, we become overstimulated to certain things to the point that it no longer impacts us. And that sign very often becomes just a byword. And it's just there. It's a piece of the property. And it no longer has meaning for us. That we're leaving here and we're going out there, which means we're on mission with God. And that's where we have to get back. That's the basics. And that's where we need to go back to. And I told you there's some things that we must change. If we are to be a growing church, there are some things that must change. And last week we spent a great deal of time, the whole time, the entire time, speaking about the importance of prayer. And we need to change the way we pray. And one of the things that we have to change about the way we pray is intentionality in prayer and uh, the direction of our prayer. That must change. I'm not going to rehash that because I want to take you through the other two things that I believe have to change. These three things total, last week's plus the two I'm going to mention tonight, these three combined are the three emphases of every church that had plateaued or was declining and then turned around and improved. 
these three things. And the, the first of those was prayer. Prayer is always the number one thing. But the second of those that declines, that has to be changed, is evangelism and the way we do evangelism. And if we're to grow, we have to change the way we do evangelism. Now, let me say something. What is behind us should not be what is before us. In fact, I can sustain that with scripture. Paul said, forgetting that which is behind, I press on. And what is behind us should not be that which is before us. So I took a look back. I wanted to find out what I could find out about our baptisms over a lengthy period of time. In fact, Kayla gave me more information than I asked for when she went to ACS and she had to actually call up wherever their offices are. I don't know where they are in Tennessee or Atlanta or someplace not here, I can tell you that. And she had to say, this is what my pastor wants. And the lady said, well, let me see if I can help you find it. And uh, they pulled out some information. Um, if I read it correctly, and if she understood it correctly, when she gave it to us, we had a lot of years in the history of this church from 1970 forward in which we only baptized one person. If I saw it right, if I read it right, there were 10 or 12 years with just one in the tally. And there were a number of years in which we only baptized two or three people. Last year was one of those three years that we only baptized two or three. Now, I'm emphasizing that because those numbers portray a pattern in the life of, of a church. And I don't think it's how the church sees itself. I don't think that's how we believe, what we believed about ourselves. But that's what I'm seeing in here. And you see, when we consistently baptize only a few, then our, our expectations become especially, for example, on Sunday morning during the invitation time, and, and Brother David's over here, and Brother Drew's over here, and I'm standing here, our expectation is nobody's going to respond. And Dr. Berger, you remember the story of the young man who went to Spurgeon complaining about that very thing, and he said, no one responds. And Spurgeon said, come on, young man, surely you didn't expect people to respond when you preached? He said, no, I guess not. And he pointed at him and said, and that's your problem. You don't expect it. And ladies and gentlemen, we create this, this expectation. If we have the expectation for people to respond, you know what's going to happen? We're going to pray and ask God to move on people's hearts. We're going to do that. It creates an expectation, a lower expectation of the church. And for a church to turn around, the church must raise its expectations. And we must begin to expect people to respond to the gospel. We must pray in this church for people to respond to the gospel. You say, well, I do pray for that. I understand. We must pray for that in prayer teams, in prayer groups, on Wednesday nights. We must pray for God to move on those who attend worship at this church. We must do that. So that's, that's ex extremely important. And there's something I need to share with you. Evangelism must become very natural for us. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, as they're closing out their prayer, and they have say, stated more than one time, look how they're persecuting us. 
Look how they're persecuting your son. Look at what they're saying. They said, fill us with the Spirit so that we can have boldness to share the Word of God. I'm paraphrasing that. But that's exactly what uh, the disciples prayed when they gathered in that prayer meeting after they were threatened. I want you to know evangelism needs to be so natural that when we pray, we pray for God to fill us so that people will respond to the message of God. We have to do that. Almost every growing church is evangelistic in nature. I say almost because I can give you examples of they call themselves churches but they're not evangelistic. They have a different message, but um, they grow anyway. Almost every evangelist, every growing church is evangelistic in nature. I want to quote Ed Stetzer for you in um, uh, his book, Comeback Churches. And he said, comeback churches think and live evangelism. But how can a church develop a comprehensive and effective evangelistic strategy? You need to realize it's possible and that churches are doing it every day. And then he goes on. I'm going to summarize what he said. You have to have a good plan. Well, there's a big duh behind that one, isn't there? You need a really good plan. I want to be honest with you. It's confession time for me. I've had a number of good plans. But I've not presented them to you because it costs money. I talked about one of them with staff one time, Sarah, before y'all uh, and you and Drew came on board. I talked with staff one time. I said, this is what I want us to do. It's going to cost us $15,000. And of course, the entire staff said, impossible. We'll never do it. So we hadn't done it. We hadn't done it. It's still a good plan. I know it is. Uh, I believe, I believe that one of the hindrances I have had in my spirit is I've been afraid to spend money because of things like this heating unit that's going to take us 50 something hundred dollars to fix. Oh, and I haven't mentioned to you today the compressor that's got to be replaced, which is $8,500 on top of that. So we've got to spend $14,000 on maintenance on this right here and fourteen thousand dollars I could do an awful lot of evangelism with fourteen thousand dollars makes me want to I, I recommend we sell the whole place and move somewhere else I, I said makes me didn't say we're doing it okay just every once in a while I feel that way y'all do too if you'll confess it some of you ain't gonna confess it <laughs> that's all right we have to have a good plan and we have to have those who are willing to go fishing. You got to go after souls, folks. We live in a day they will very seldom come here. Now, every once in a while, the Holy Spirit is dealing with a person and he'll push that person through the doors and they'll hear the gospel. And praise God when that happens. But the majority of them are out there. And if you walk up to them today and you ask these individuals whether they are 60 years old or whether they are 16 years old in 21st century America, do you think much on spiritual things? Guess what the answer is? No. <laughs> I do not. Well, do you think much about eternity? No, I'm worried about today. I'm worried about this life. And that's, that's what's happening in America today. We no longer have people who wake up in the morning concerned about their spiritual condition. I believe with all my heart that will return if we have a revival in the church and if we have an awakening in this land. Ireland in the 19th century had no interest in the things of God and then the Spirit of God swept over that place and people would run to the, literally run to the churches to be able to hear the Word of God. I believe if we ever
ever see revival, we will see that kind of thing. Men and women will want to come because people love to see a fire. They love it. Which is why you need to be praying for Dr. Terry Long and Chris Smith who will lead our worship during the uh, revival meeting coming up in just a, a, little, a little over a month. We need to be praying for them right now that God will set them on fire. That the Spirit of God will so consume them. We need to do that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for that purpose. But we have to be willing to go fishing. All of us. So how do you do that? How do you get folks willing to go fishing? See, number one, you have to pray and ask God to send out laborers into the harvest. And you and I need to be intentional every week about praying for our members to go out and share their faith. I'm going to be the first to admit I don't do that intentionally as I ought to and I'm sorry and y'all forgive me for that but um, those kinds of things have to change and they need to change now now let me ask you a question and you can answer me if you want to uh, this is not necessarily rhetorical but what do you think stops us from sharing the gospel as we should well, I'm gonna take fear factor off the table okay you can't use fear that's gone. It's over here on the side. Okay. So besides that, not recognizing the opportunity. Okay. That would stop us, keep us from sharing if we didn't recognize, well, that was an open door. How many times y'all walked by or left someone and thought, should have shared the gospel with that person? I have. On um, more than one continent, <laughs> I've done that. Not knowing how to um, approach a person about, uh, about Jesus. Okay, good. Not knowing how to introduce the very idea of, 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 of spiritual things to an individual. Not knowing how to change that conversation and move it into that subject where, you know, you're talking about spiritual things and then leading them to understanding of Christ. I finished your thought there, but I don't know if it included that or not. Okay? I'm sorry? Ooh, self-absorbed. How many here are self-absorbed? Get out. Do we care? Do we really, really care? By the way, uh, when Pam was called, uh, you know, I was called to missions first. And then I told Pam she was called. <laughs> I'm not the Holy Spirit, so that didn't work too well. And uh, I started changing my strategy there. Okay, God, if you've called me, you got to call her. You have to call her. Because she's going to be lonely, I'm taking the kids with me. So, <laughs> Lord, you have to call her. And then we were singing in um, Palm Sunday in, in 1987. And the very song we were singing said, do you really care? Do you care enough to go? And the last verse said, I care, Lord, I will go. And uh, care. Do we really care? All right. Let me give you some others. This comes from Pew Research as well as Barna and Gallup and a few other folks. And it's over a 12 year or so period. The answers have come across the same almost consistently. In fact, the numbers are growing more negative in terms of what I'm about to talk to you about. Uh, the, the statistics are increasing in a negative sense is what I mean to say. And that is the fact that more and more people believe that there's more than one way to be saved. More and more people believe as long as you're faithful to whatever you believe, you'll be saved. And so Muslims who are faithful will go to heaven. And Buddhists who are faithful will go to heaven. 
and even atheists who are just good and not immoral people will wake up surprised in heaven. They're going to wake up surprised. But the other number is this, con uh, goes along with this. Fewer and fewer people believe in the reality of hell. And so they don't believe people are lost. And if you don't be, believe people are lost, you tend not to worry about sharing. You tend not to care. But I have news for us. If you do not know Christ Jesus, if you have not by an act of your will and faith repented and believed on the Lord Jesus and you die you go to hell if you are old enough to grasp the reality of sin and separation from God and you die you go to hell and so child evangelism with this dear lady right here and those that works with her is crucial. That's why we have VBS, among other things. And youth evangelism is crucial, which is why Drew and Makita and, 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 and Dr. D and some others, did you go? to uh, Jackson after Christmas uh, and went up and took these young people so they could hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in another setting. That's why. Because ladies and gentlemen, people who do not know Christ die and they go to hell. In spite of that, the Word of God still stands. And we are debtors. We are debtors to the people of Hattiesburg. We owe them the gospel message. We are debtors to the people of Petal. We owe them the gospel message. Forest and Lamar counties, we are debtors to them. If you happen to be a traveler, you're a debtor wherever you end up going. You're responsible. So we've got to get to a place where Evangelism takes priority in the church. Where it's once again, you say, well, we used to have a, an outreach program. We did. We had an outreach program and we tried hard. And Brother Dale and I remember one time, uh, we, I don't know how many blocks we walked, brother, but we walked a long ways together. We've been to apartments together. We've been up and down different roads. And then literally one day, one day we walked in and or actually I was already here and I was the only one here. And the next week I was the only one here. And the third week I was the only one here. And I said, okay. And so I stopped it because it was evident that that was a method that we can no longer count on. So we're going to have to find new ways. I need you to do something for me. I need you to pray for me as your pastor, as the lead evangelist in the church because Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 
do the work, it might be verse 2, do the work of an evangelist. And I'm the lead evangelist in the church. I recognize that. I need you to pray for me to find as many methods as I possibly can that will be effective in Lamar and Forest Counties. Because I promise you, and these dear missionaries that are with us I tell you, there are places we can walk overseas and we have the open door to share the gospel and folks repent. And I was telling somebody, I think just last week, uh, I think it was that I grew very accustomed to seeing somebody saved every time I preached the gospel. And I was plain surprised when it didn't happen. And now it's almost the converse. If somebody's saved now while I'm preaching the gospel, I think I'd faint, you know? Because we in America, well, we're different. One more thing to share with you. Um, the third thing that needs to take place, the first thing is prayer. We've got to change the way we pray. The second thing is evangelism. We have to change the way we do evangelism. The third thing is discipleship. We've got to change the way we disciple believers. And I believe that this change is going to be as great a challenge as the other two areas that I just mentioned. You know why? We get comfortable with a certain way of doing things and we don't like people messing with it when we do that. I'm going to get real personal <clears throat> and historical with you for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when we first came here and I, I took staff up into um, a, a meeting about this very thing about evangelism, discipleship, and I don't remember what else we were at, uh, had up there, Brother David, but there were a number of different things. We came back and we agreed together as a staff that we needed to, we needed to make some changes in order to have more effective discipleship. And so we tried to take one quarter out of the entire church year, just one quarter to emphasize a very deep and strong discipleship. I had a revolution on my hands, y'all. I had a literal, re I had people saying, if you do that, I will not come back. So I said, okay, I'll wait. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to do discipleship. We must be growing people. Discipleship never ends. Y'all remember the story I told you about starting a church and some former church members came back and I said, you're welcome to join us here, but you've got to go through discipleship. They said, I've already been discipled. Ladies and gentlemen, none of us ever stopped being discipled. If you are, if you are a uh, believer in Christ, go back and look at the Great Commission. It's actually in participles, going, making, teaching, making disciples is an ongoing process. And go look at Philippians chapter 3. Paul said, this is share a paraphrase, I ain't arrived yet. You never, never, never stop learning about the Lord God. Never. So we have to do these things. You know what? The Swiss lost first place in watchmaking because they wouldn't pursue the trend towards uh, newer and different kinds of watch, uh, the, in, the insides of a watch, the components, the movement. They wouldn't change and so they lost first place. When, we're like what, when we like what we're doing, we don't want it changed. I understand this. I understand it. I'm that way. How many of you like it when they start moving things around down at Walmart? Oh, I hope one of those Walmart people watches this. You just... I walk in, I went in, and I had everything memorized on the cereal roll. I love cereal. You know, and I'm walking down the cereal row one day, and I walked through there, and I stopped, and I looked, and they'd taken everything from this end, they'd moved it down here, and everything from this end, and they moved it to the middle, and they swapped stuff around. And I thought, 
Well, Jiminy Crickets, now I've got to figure out where everything is now. And so instead of being able to walk through and grab a couple things and keep on rolling, because men don't like to look at stuff, they want to know where it is, get it and get out. Yes or no? And so now I have to stop, and I'm looking at the bottom row, which is way down there, and, and I can't see, and I get my glasses on, and I'm looking sideways, and... Then I have to look at the top row and the middle rows and, and it takes me a lot longer to go through because you got too many choices here. We don't like things changed on us. I understand that. But I have a goal, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to restructure some things by the fall and there's some key areas that we need to work on. One of them is, and I've already, I don't know where, where was Matt this morning? Find out where Matt was. Send him a text. Tell him I'm talking about him right now. Well, okay, Sarah's not feeling well. Where's Matt? All right. <laughs> He's in charge of the new members class. He knows it. I've already talked with him about it. Um, we may restructure some of Sunday morning Bible study. Hadn't decided how that's going to look yet. I want to see at least two more small groups formed. Not necessarily for Sunday morning, though I would love to see us have more and more groups on Sunday morning. We have a lot of classes that are empty now, a lot of space that's empty. I want to see it go the other way, not the way it's going right now. I want to see that sort of thing happen. Um, and I hope to establish, as we talked about six weeks ago now, at least one open group. Where, whereby we invite the public at large. In fact, I was talking to Pam this morning, Pam Emrick that, that spoke for us this morning, and she's going to come in here in a few weeks when I set it up with her, and we're going to have a class on human trafficking. And I'm going to say to you the word that she couldn't say this morning because the children were present. This is largely sex trafficking, where they're, they're kidnapping little children and making child porn movies with them. And they're taking teenage girls and turning them into prostitutes and so on and so forth. Um, she's going to teach us how to recognize those signs. I'm going to have her come in. It'll take her two or three weeks. It'll be one of those short blitz classes. And she'll do it on Sunday nights. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll have that class. But there's some other classes that I've mentioned before that I think we need to have as well. Nothing I'm sharing with you is going to come easily. Nothing. And nothing, in all likelihood, will have immediate positive results. But we've got to make changes, and we have to have renewal in those three areas. In our prayer ministries, our evangelistic ministries, and our discipleship ministries, if we're going to continue to be the 38th Avenue Baptist Church. Because to the contrary, statistically speaking, we got about 10 years. And I want to turn that into 110. I don't want to be the guy they say, you see that old crotchety preacher? He's the one that killed 38th Avenue Baptist. He turned out the lights. I'm not going to be that guy. By the grace of God. You going to help me? I know you will. Starts with prayer. Then evangelism, then discipleship. These are going to be our emphases over the next two or three years. And you're going to hear it till you're going to have lunch and have roasted preacher. He might be fried preacher. And say, I wish he'd quit talking about it. But you're going to hear it. Let me pray for us. Father, your word 
inspires us and teaches us and motivates us and Lord so many things you teach us in the word one thing the examples that you show us over and over again about what happens when churches walk filled with the Spirit of God and I pray indeed that we'll be that kind of church and I pray Father we'll be an example to the Forest and Lamar counties and if the state wants to sit up and take notice then fine but more than anything that we're noticed in heaven for what we're doing because above all things Father we want to please you and that's what we desire I bless you I thank you I magnify you in Jesus name Amen.